hello. So, Zdravé uh, mamo. Uh, that was Hi Mom in Bulgarian. Uh, my name is Pavlin, and uh, I work as a software developer in uh, Hacksoft, which is an outsourcing company. And uh, I do mainly Python, which is uh, Django, and JavaScript, uh, which is React. And uh, you can find me in Twitter, just like this. So I want to start with uh, this. It, it, this slide was not initially in my presentation. And you might already know, but uh, my talk was scheduled for a Wednesday. But sadly, my flight got delayed, and uh, we missed our connection. So uh, I want to thank, firstly, to Alexander Hendorf and, uh, for uh, the assistance, and to, to Owen Campbell for stepping in and taking my slot, which uh, made this talk possible. So I, if you can do a round of applause for them, it will be really good. And a little disclaimer, uh, my talk was shared for 40 minutes, but now I have only 30, so bear with me and let's get started. So, Python is synchronous. What does that mean? It means that uh, each line executes uh, in order from top to bottom. And uh, knowing that, let's take a look at the following example. You have a line of code that makes a call to a remote server, and this means that the program is uh, doing nothing while it's waiting for the response. It just waits. And the program uh, blocks and waits for the response in order to continue. So what if you have several line of codes that do the same? Each line will execute when the previous line is done waiting. And in a short, you will wait more. And you will be blocked more time. So how can we solve this? How can we speed up the program? Can we make it non-blocking? Of course you can. And one way to do this is uh, with threads. Uh, threads are dead. If you haven't seen uh, this uh, talk by David Beasley, I highly recommend you to do it. So you, you can spin up uh, multiple threads, each, each thread doing one thing at a time. And uh, when multiple threads are running, each CPU uh, can run one thread at a time. So in order to allow, uh, if, you have, if you have more threads, in order to allow all threads to share resources, the CPU uh, very often context switches between the threads in a non-deterministic uh, order. And threads are great, but sometimes they, they can make the, co the code more complicated and harder to understand. And there are also race conditions and deadlocks. Um, and about the non-blocking thing, there is another way to, to make it. Um, we can make our code asynchronous. Uh, with the synchronous programming, the software, e.g. our application, uh, manages the thread, uh, manages the threads and the context switching rather than the CPU, which means that the context is going to be switched at a defined points rather than an, in non-deterministic interval. And one way to do a synchronous programming uh, is with an event loop. So there's uh, an, an event loop and there's a queue of events, so-called tasks, and the loop constantly pulls tasks from the queue and runs them. Uh, one way to do asynchronous programming in Python is with AsyncIO. AsyncIO is a standard library which was added in Python 3.4 and uh, provides an event loop. So let's take a look how can we use uh, AsyncIO to write asynchronous code in Python. So this is uh, what we have to do. Uh, in this example, we import uh, a syncIO at the top, and then we define a coroutine using the async def keywords. So this, is, this function is the coroutine. It's like a normal function, but it has de a sync in front of the def, and it has an await expression, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. So what this coroutine does is it prints hello. It's, uh, it waits several seconds and then prints world with the respective delay, and then finishes. So uh, the next thing we do is we get the event loop, we uh, create uh, tasks and schedule them in the event loop, and then we run the event loop forever. Uh, what, let's see what is going to happen if we execute this code uh, in Python 3.6.3. So 
hello will be printed twice. As we saw, we, we have hello at the top. So hello will be printed twice after one second, uh, world with delay one will be printed, and after another second, world with delay two is printed. So both tasks start simultaneously, and the second task finishes one second later than the first task. So this is exactly what we wanted, right? I mean, the program didn't block. So, yeah, I forgot to click that. So the program didn't block. We shadowed two tasks, and they started at the same time. The second task didn't have to wait for the first task to finish. And we achieved that by defining a core routine and we, uh, with the async dev keywords. And we used an await expression inside it, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So, but what exactly is a core routine? I mean, uh, what does that term mean? Easiest thing to do, let's ask Google about that. So, Google tells us a core routine, the core routines are computer program components that generalize subroutines for non preemptive multitasking by allowing multiple entry points for suspending and resuming execution at certain locations. Uh, well, my understanding about this definition hasn't changed since the first time I read it. I mean, I remember looking at my screen just like the cat in the picture. And my first thoughts were, what if I have to explain this to someone else? I mean, this is a picture, this is a picture of me and my niece, Ralitza. Uh, she's two years old, and she's really cute, and I love her so much. So in this picture, uh, yeah. Uh, so she's teaching me how to draw here. And believe me, she's better than me, even though she's two years old. So what if I have to explain to her what a core routine is? I will have to start with the basics. Uh, in this talk, we are going to talk about order of execution, the iterator protocol, generator functions. We're going to talk about yield from, and then we, uh, we will make a definition of a core routine in Python. And then we're going to look at the asyncio.coroutine and types.coroutine decorators, and finally, Last but not least, we're going to talk about async and await. So, order of execution. As we already said, in the beginning, each line executes from top to bottom in order. So, until an exception is raised, for example. In this example, the message after the raise will never be executed. Uh, another way to end the function's execution is when a return statement is reached. In this example, the print message below the return will never be executed. So return implies that the function is returning control back to the point from, there, from where it was initially called from. Uh, and another way to, uh, another way to, ex uh, yeah, there's, there's yield, I mean, it implies that uh, the transfer of control is temporarily, and the function expects to regain it in the future. Uh, we will get back to it in a minute, but before that, we have to mention a few more things. Um, first, iterable. What's an iterable? So the iterable is an object that is capable of returning its members one at a time. For example, a list, a tuple, dict, string, etc. So an iterable is an object of any class that has defined the underscore, underscore, iter, underscore, underscore method. So uh, in a short, an iterable is something that can be used on the right side of the for loop. So iterator, this was iterable, this is iterator. What's an iterator? That's an object representing a stream of data. Uh, and repeated calls to the iterator's next method return successive items from the stream. And when no more data is available, a stop iteration exception is, is raised instead. Uh, iterators are required to have an iter method that returns the iterator itself. Let's check out an example. So this is a pretty useless iterator class. Um, here, that 
that iterator, we return the numbers from one to three. And as we already said, uh, we have an iter method that returns self. And in the next method, we, we, we return the numbers from one to three. And if the, number is, the next number is higher than three, we raise a stop iteration exception. Let's see how can we use it. So first, we have to make an instance of our iterator class. And then we can manually call the next method on it. The first time we call next, it returns one. Next time it returns two. Third time it returns three. And if we call it again, it will raise a stop iteration exception, which is really nice. So another way to get its values is to iterate over the iterator with a for loop. So what the for loop does is it calls the iter method and then consecutively calls the next method of the iterator. And when a stop iteration exception is raised, the loop is exited successfully. So let's get back to the ut keyword. So what does that word mean? Uh, what does that word do? Uh, let's talk about generator functions. So if the body of a function contains ut, that function automatically becomes a generator function. And once we call the generator function, it returns generator iterator. And we can, get the val we can get the values from the generator iterator by calling next on it. And once the generator is exhausted, it will raise a stop iteration. You and you can consume the values of a generator only once. Let's check out an example. So this is a normal function, but instead of returning, we uh, return values by yielding them. And since the function has yield inside it, that function is a generator function. Let's see how can we use it. So when we call the generator function, nothing will get printed. It will, it will, return, oops, it will return a generator iterator. And from now on, when I say a generator, I will be referring to the value returned after calling the generator functor. So gen is a generator iterator, and I will call it a generator. So uh, how can we get the values? We have to call next. Um, if you saw the, uh, the uh, if you saw the function, you will see that it's, it prints a string, returns one. Then we call. We can. And what happens is that let's see the function again. What happens is that at the point where it returns one, the function pauses. Uh, it, 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 it's not destroyed. It pauses and it keeps its context. So. At this point, uh, when it returns one, when we call next, it will resume from the, from the place where it was paused, e.g. the first yield, then it will print yield in second value, it will return two, and finally it will raise a stop iterations exception. Uh, so generator, generators have a send method. What does the send method do? Well, it, resume, it resumes the execution of a generator and passes a value into it. I mean, sending none in the send method is equivalent to calling the next method of a generator. And uh, the send will return the value yielded by the generator just like next does. Let's see an example. Everything is the same except this line over there. So what we've done is we've assigned the yield expression to a variable. And the value that we're going to pass to the send method will be assigned to that variable. Let's see how it works. Uh, we have to instantiate, instantiate our generator, which returns a generator iterator, which I call a generator. And we can call send with none, which is equivalent to calling next on the generator, which is going to print, going to yield value, and is going to return 42. So, the next time, we can call the send method with a string, which will be assigned to the variable received, and it will be printed. And the next time we call send with none or with a string, it doesn't matter, a stop iteration exception is raised. So in Python 3.3, a new feature comes in play, yield from. The yield from expression, so if we, if we loop over an iterator, and each and yield each value, this will be equivalent to 
yielding from the iterator. And uh, when the iterator is a generator, uh, it will be exhausted first, and I mean, I mean, it will get every value from that generator, and then the execution continues. How is this helpful? I mean, it's helpful because yield from allows us to chain generators, which is really cool. Let's see an example. Okay, this is a little bit complicated. We have a generator for a generator, which yields one, prints some string, and yields two. And in the second generator, we get uh, we make an instance of that generator function. We yield from it, we yield from the generator, then we print a string, and we yield three. So, what happens when we try to run that code? We get the second generator, and the, f the first next call pauses the second generator. Oops. Pauses the second generator at the point of yield from, and goes into the first generator, which returns one. So, the next time we call next, the string from the first generator is going to be printed, which is in the middle of first generator, and two is going to be returned. And the next time we call next, in the middle of second generator, three is returned. And then it raises top iteration exception. Let's, knowing all of this, I mean the functionalities, the capabilities of generators, let's take a look at the definition from the beginning. Coroutines, are computer and program components that generalize subroutines for non-preemptive multitasking by allowing multiple entry points for suspending and resuming execution at certain locations. Now, it looks like a coroutine is an object which implements the methods of a generator. And so suddenly all generators implement the coroutine interface, but the generators were not meant to be in use that fashion. So with its arrival in Python 3.4, Asyncio provides a useful decorator in order to solve this issue. So what does decorator, what this decorator does is, uh, well, it is used to label a function as acting as a coroutine that was meant to be used with a SyncIO, and a SyncIO required all generators that are going to be used with a SyncIO to be decorated with this decorator. So let's check out the example with a SyncIO, which was from the beginning and was using Python 3.63. This is the example, same thing. So let's compare it with how a SyncIO was used back in Python 3.4 when Asyncio origin, uh, when Asyncio originated. The only difference here, as you can see, is that we are not using async def, but we're using a normal function, which is a generator, because it has yield from, and we decorate it with Asyncio, and instead of awaiting, we use yield from. And with generator support and an event loop in the form of Asyncio, at the point of Python 3.4, there was enough to support asynchronous programming in Python in the form of concurrent programming. What does concurrent programming mean? It means that it, with concurrent programming, we write code that is supposed to be executed independently of other parts, but it all ex executes in a single thread. I mean, the, the event loop is, is running in a single thread. And we create tasks and shadow them in the loop, and when the task, the task then is monitored by, the, by that loop, and when the task is done, its result is sent back to the coroutine via the send method that we already looked at. Uh, and in Python 3.5, the types coroutine decorator comes, which what it does is it, it flags a generator as a coroutine, just like asyncio.coroutine does. And it looks like finally we have arrived. Uh, I guess all of you are here for this slide and the next one. So the async keyword goes before def. I guess I have to click, yeah. Async, uh, the async keyword goes before def in order to show that a method is asynchronous. And 
a sync, a sync def is used to define a function as being a coroutine. And the key thing about a sync and types.coroutine decorator uh, do is that they tighten the definition of what a coroutine is. It takes coroutines from simply being uh, an interface to an actual object. And if you use inspect, the inspect model and use the function is coroutine, it will only return true uh, for the functions that are defined with async def. And this makes the distinction between a generator and a generator that is meant to be a coroutine a lot more strict. Uh, so the next slide, await. The await expression also comes in Python 3.5 uh, and the await keyword is only valid inside an async dev functions. Await operates much like yield from, but the acceptable objects to an await expression are a little bit different. Uh, when you call await on an object, that object needs to be awaitable. What does that mean? Well, I guess you can, yeah, it was easy. I mean, awaitable object is object of a class that defines the await method. And the await method should return an iterator, but that iterator should not be a coroutine itself. But, I mean, coroutines are awaitable and uh, they are awaitable objects and they can be used on the right side of the await expression. Um, the key thing here is that await will not accept a generator that is not flagged as a coroutine. I mean, even though generators kind of support the coroutine interface, this is the key thing because the await expression protects us from accidentally using a generator instead of a coroutine. Uh, but there's a catch, as always. Um, you cannot use yield in uh, a sync def function. And the only way to return a value in an async def function, which we, we can call coroutine, is by using return, either return or await. So, a sync allows us to distinct coroutines from generators, and the await expression makes sure that one does not mix and match objects that match the same interface, I mean the API of coroutines, and makes it more clear that these objects are await that these objects are waiting for coroutines to finish. And the await that we saw is the switch point. I mean, this is, it practically means go do something else while I'm um, waiting for something to finish, and when I'm done, come back here and continue. And a sync and await in general make it more clear that the code is uh, asynchronous. So once, me once methods are not confused with generators. And the follow-up question is, what's next? I mean, the most, uh, a sync and await give us, provide us the, an, an API for asynchronous programming in Python. And the cool thing is that People are using it. Um, David Beasley, uh, he made an awesome talk, and he made Curio, which is an alternative for AsyncIO. And from what I saw in uh, his keynote, which I highly recommend you to uh, watch, is that what he did there is, was based on Curio, and Nathaniel Smith made Trio, which is another library for asynchronous programming. And the cool thing is that Async.io is, uh, I mean, it's a core library in, in Python, and it's adapting, and it's evolving, and it's looking, and I mean, Curio and Tio are helping the, are helping the asynchronous Python world to, 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 to evolve. And for me, uh, what it means is that I have to make, I have to make another talk, um, because as a software developer, my job, is to write good code and to improve it and evolve it and support all functionalities. And this is what I do in my, in my work project. And this is what Python core developers are doing with the language that I'm using in order to write my project in work. And 
that's the definition of software development, actually. Um, I don't know if I said it, but uh, I'm a physics graduate. I'm, I'm, I haven't been in a software development school. I mean, and when we learn new things, we apply them and we refactor our code. And while we refactor the code, we learn new things and repeat again the process. I mean, learn something new, refactor, learn something new, refactor, evolve, improve. And personally, I observe how Python is evolving with great anticipation, and I really can't, can't wait to see what's next. And thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pavel. Okay. Yeah, you can yeah. find all the code snippets in this repository. Uh, okay, we have time for one, maybe two questions. Anyone? Here, okay. Hi, great talk. Uh, if we want to call out to uh, something outside of Python, like C++ code written and bound with something like PyBind or something, can we also use asynchronous functions, and how do we go about doing that? Um, well, you, uh, let me check if I understood the question correctly. You are asking how to call asynchronous code from uh, synchronous code. Asynchronous from synchronous or the other way around? Uh, I'm asking how to make an asynchronous function that calls out outside of Python. To calls something outside. It could be making an HTTP I mean, request. The, the, the thing that it calls, uh, the, the synchronous function has to call uh, another asynchronous library. I mean, the be your best bet is to have a library written in a synchronous manner. So that's what I'm asking. How do I do that? How do no, I you have to library? rewrite your library to be asynchronous. And how do I do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> OK. OK, any other questions? Uh, him? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, I'm curious if there's like any, a use case for using the generator way to do it or the, to use the decorators, so the Senkaio decorator or the types decorator, or are those just obsolete and we should just well, always use a sync and await? Um, at the current moment, you should always use a sync and await, and I don't have much experience with the synchronous code. I mean, I haven't written a lot of code in, with it, but at the moment, you have uh, a sync and await, and you should use that. I mean, the generators were there because they were needed. But they were not near. They were. They are not near it anymore. Okay. One more quick question. Here. Okay. So a similar question about use cases. So I was curious. What is the use case for using yield from as opposed to using iter tools chain? Can you repeat? Iter tools chain and using yield from. What's the What's the use case for using yield from? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, I can't answer that question. Fair enough. Thanks. Uh, okay. So let's thank uh, Pavlin once again. <laughs> <laughs>